Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CIS uh, webinar on COVID-19. Uh, today, um, I am Carolyn Balo. I will be one of your moderators, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Um, before I do so, I just want to remind everyone that there is a chat function um, in our webinar, webinar software, attendee chat. Please um, put any questions um, or comments that you have for our speaker in the attendee chat, um, and we will address those um, at the conclusion of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Per Soler, uh, who is going to be presenting a talk entitled Pediatric COVID-19, Our Experience in Catalonia and Spain, The Role of Children in Viral Transmission. Thank you very much, Caroline, for your presentation, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm extremely glad and proud to be here sharing this uh, webinar with all of you and, and Kate, absolutely proud of it. And I hope that you will uh, find it um, interesting, but let's see. Uh, as Caroline said, I will just talk about the uh, experience that we have here with pediatric uh, COVID-19. And uh, you will see that uh, I will not be reviewing, I mean, papers from others. What we, I will be doing is presenting our own job during these few months of epidemics here. I hope it's useful to you because we are now facing some kind of second flare, so uh, just to get prepared. So that's my conflict of interest, no, nothing related to this communication. And uh, that's a table of contents. I will try to tell you what's on the other side of the ocean, that's Europe. And I would focus on children, I'm a pediatric immunologist, but today I would uh, work mainly as a pediatrician and I would talk about this data that we have obtained from uh, children in Spain, more detailed data in children from Catalonia. For those that don't know, this is a region or an area or a country or whatever, I will not go into that, that's a political uh, question. And after that, I will uh, work on a viral transmission uh, based on two works that we have done together with other hospitals here in Catalonia. And at the very end, this part, Kate would go into that with more detail. I would talk about uh, this easy survey about COVID-19 in primary immune deficient patients. So let's move on. That's it. That's how things are going in Europe. And you hear it's clear that uh, Spain is not in a good moment. We are red and remain red for the uh, whole summer. And that's uh, week 32 to 33. But if you just look for the next week, which is the last one, you can see that things are even worse. And it's not worse only in Spain, but also if you go back to that and then we move forward again, but also in France and also in UK and many other countries, just like those areas in the south of Germany. So it seems that even before than we expected, uh, before our term is coming, we are facing this kind of new uh, flare or wave of the epidemic. So that's why I think that uh, data from Spain can be interesting and, and useful. Here you can see on the upper side of the slide, you will see uh, that mainly in the northern regions of Spain, we are facing this uh, second wave, mainly in some regions. Uh, here you can see on the first graph, you will see the peak on March and April, and now the peak on uh, July and August. It's true that mostly uh, those patients remain asymptomatic or present with uh, mild clinical phenotypes the slight gray bars on the bottom left uh, graph uh, can show it. And luckily, uh, those patients mainly remain in the primary care and they don't need to be admitted because the number of hospitalizations and death shown on the uh, right bottom you are, can see it's very, very low. I mean, I mean, if you look to that in detail, you will see that's a slight increase in hospitalization and deaths. But that's, that's obviously not the same that happened in March and April in our country. Uh, but the thing is that we want to open the schools on September the 14th, so probably that's not the best uh, situation for that. Okay, next. Loading, sorry for that. I think, yes, here I am. But despite uh, all this incredible number of cases that we are facing, this is an interesting study performed by the uh, health ministry of, uh, in Spain, uh, showing that by the end of June, after the first peak, um, you can see that there's uh, 
around 5% of zero prevalence uh, in the whole uh, population, and it's even lower in pediatric population, around 3 and 3.5%. And it doesn't change from the first round to the third round, as you will see in the next slide. So it's true that the serological tests that they use for this INICOVID study that was already published in The Lancet um, are not the best one. They are not ELISA, some they are fast tests. But uh, as you can see, the numbers of patients who were a uh, number of inhabitants who seroconverted was very, 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 very low. And in addition to that, you can see that seroconversion from one round to the other, it remained below uh, 1%. And in addition to that, if you look for the loss of antibodies, and this is a well-known thing, from the first to the third round, uh, around 15% of patients lost their antibodies. And that was, and it is known too, more common in asymptomatic individuals. It was around an 11%. And surprisingly to me, it was much less common in individuals with a uh, loss of taste and, and smell, probably due to a high viral load in the upper respiratory tract that could promote a more intense immune response. But I don't know if that's the reason for that. But that's, uh, those are the results that we found in that, in that study. Obviously, that creates some kind of uh, depression in the country because after all these kind of severe cases, all this kind of um, death that occurred in March and April in Spain, everyone was expecting to have, I mean, 50, 60 percent of seroprevalence and suspecting that those were the peak of the iceberg and that we have not seen those asymptomatic cases in the population. And that's what's not the case. So it's a long road still to, to go. And now, as I said before, I will focus on, on children. And that's the first study that we performed, including 50 hospitals. That was a multi-center study uh, from the beginning of the epidemic to uh, 1st of July. It included more than 350 children. One third were below two years of age. No significant gender um, differences uh, in difference to what it is for the adults. And I would not look for the co-infection rate because, as you all know, we are not looking for all the viruses and bacteria uh, in the nasopharyngeal aspirate uh, during the crisis because we were only able to look for, for SARS-CoV-2. But even though this is not that uh, low, a lot of significant proportion of these patients were admitted, but not all of them were admitted due to COVID. I mean, that means that some of them were admitted for other reasons and had COVID while being in the hospital. And that's why we will work on these 214 uh, total patients. We were able to demonstrate that more than half of these patients were secondary cases from adult contacts. And a very low percent of patients presented with significant comorbidities. And I will go into that later on. To know, around one quarter required um, PICU admission and only four of them died. And it's to know that all of them presented with previous significant comorbidities. So again, it seems that uh, that's not a lethal disease in children, except for these patients presenting with severe multisystemic um, syndrome. Almost all of them were diagnosed by PCR and a few of them by serologies. It's true that the usefulness and the availability of serologies uh, came later than and PCR, so that's probably the reason for that. And if you look for the main diagnosis in the patients that were admitted, it was pneumonia, but obviously it was pneumonia in a lesser extent what it is for the adults. Um, this multi-inflammatory syndrome account for around 15 percent and it's quite interesting to see that as it happened in the european data and other groups you can see that the small peak that we have with this multi-inflammatory syndrome uh, occurred three to four weeks later than the start of the epidemic i have to say that despite you can see that we have 36 patients with this classification it is true that we didn't even find significant and severe uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome, syndrome. I mean, and uh, probably the reason for that is that the person of uh, black children in our area is lower than what it is in the UK and the US, where there was the, the mainly affected um, race. Obviously, you have these uh, GI symptoms that make things different from the adults and all the other things that are already well known. Uh, when patients were admitted, um, 
around half of them required uh, oxygen supply for a low term, I mean, only four days of median days. Uh, most of them use conventional uh, oxygen supply, but some of them require, required uh, high flow nasal cannula, as you can see right here. A significant person of patients required uh, PICU admission. That, that's not the same here in Catalonia, you will see in the following slides. But it's true that less than half required invasive mechanical ventilation. And the time that they spent in the PICU was relatively uh, short if we compare with other uh, inflammatory or respiratory syndromes. Obviously, some of these patients, in addition to these four dead patients, presented with complications, mainly heart conditions. And to note, only three patients presented with uh, coronary abnormalities and, and one with uh, persistent aneurysms, which make it uh, significantly different to what it is for uh, classical Kawasaki disease. OK, so um, how did we treat these patients? I mean. We, in most cases, we did not treat them rather than uh, treating, I mean, antipyretic and so on. And you can see here that around two thirds did not receive any kind of antiviral uh, therapy. And we consider at that point antiviral as lopinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, and hydroxychloroquine. I mean, hydroxychloroquine was the most uh, commonly used drug, and it was in around four out of 10 patients. And what it's obvious in those patients with poor outcome, that means requiring uh, oxygen supply or requiring uh, intensive care unit admission, the use of the drug uh, drugs was more common. But even though you can see that only one third required uh, Calitra, less than 15% were treated with remdesivir, and hydroxychloroquine was used in set seven out of 10 of these patients. That's what That was the way that we were doing things at the very beginning of the epidemic. Obviously, right now, we are not using the drugs, and we are just using uh, remdesivir for some of these patients. I have to say that uh, the feeling is that it plays a role, but I don't know how, how important it is. So what we tried to see if we was at the very beginning if, to detect whether we were able to see any kind of clinical or analytical parameter that could help us in terms of determining the risk of hospitalization, the risk of severe phenotypes leading the patient to the need of oxygen supply or uh, admission at the intensive care unit. And from an individual point of view, none of them was significant uh, from a statistical point of view. It doesn't matter if you look for IL-6, ferritin, uh, CR, uh, C-reactive protein, and others. We, did, we were not able to find any significant correlation, but we created this uh, base algorithm uh, to try to predict poor outcome. And it was not that bad. I mean, we put together with different ways C-reactive protein hemoglobin, lymphocyte in terms of lymphopenia, uh, the, how renal function was affected, I mean, creatinine above 0 0.5, 0 0.7 survey, and age, and it was worse in patients older than two uh, years. Putting this all together, uh, weighing more C-reactive protein, anemia, and lymphocytopenia, there was this model with a 24% of accuracy and 93% of negative predictive, predictive value. I mean, we were so happy at the very beginning with this data, but my feeling now is that after seeing lots of these patients in our hospital, I mean, any kind of patients with or without comorbidities, uh, it's quite easy to detect if the patient will present some, with some kind of complication. I mean, those patients presenting with significant inflammation at the very beginning when they are uh, attending the um, emergency room, uh, those will need, uh, I mean, extra care admission and uh, really being really careful with them. But I mean, those patients who are older, who are doing well, it doesn't matter if they are presenting uh, any kind of um, comorbidities, probably except for heart, uh, congenital heart disease, those patients will do well. I mean, just from a clinical and pediatric point of view, those patients with a good and bad outcome are not difficult to, to identify. And these are data from uh, my country, area, region, or whatever it is, where we live 7.5 million 
inhibitants. And we have had lots of cases, more than uh, 125,000 uh, infected individuals. And, and luckily, we've had uh, 30,000 deaths, and we all know people, I mean, close people who, who died. Uh, in those data, and these are very recent data, you will see that uh, children are not affected by COVID significantly, even now that we are studying uh, our patients doing lots and lots of uh, PCRs in nasopharyngeal aspirates in the primary care. But that's not true for those patients between 15 and 18 who do behave like, like the adults. I mean, the feeling is that those patients above 16 are not uh, behaving probably as they do for the rest of their life as children, and they, they, they behave just like uh, young adults. And here's how the switch to a younger age has occurred from the first uh, peak in March and April to what is going on in August, where uh, most of the infected people are uh, due to social relationships from 20 to 29, and there's a significant number of patients between 10 and 19, as I mentioned before, mainly from 16 to, to 19. And that's what uh, we wanted to see in that study. Uh, schools were closed. Uh, we were assuming that uh, children did play a major role in viral transmission. So we were very worried about uh, their behavior after uh, the end of the lockdown. So that's why we created this group and we wanted to see how they were doing from a clinical and epidemiological point of view and how a viral transmission among household contacts uh, was uh, going. And this study has two parts, and there's a retrospective study where I will focus on, uh, mainly based on household transmission and the prospective study that's still going on with more than 400 patients nowadays, that was data from the last week, uh, accounts for community and household transmission, and we hoped uh, that we will obtain uh, data soon too. In fact, we have just presented the uh, retrospective data uh, this morning. So you are the second ones to, to see. I hope you will you will like it. Uh, no significant differences in uh, gender, as I mentioned before, mainly patients above 12 and, and 16. It's around a half of the global number of patients that were infected with PCR positive during the lockdown in Catalonia were uh, above uh, 12 years of age. There was a non-significant trend to a uh, higher risk of admission in female and in those patients being below three years of age. But I have to say that the feeling is that this occurred because at the very beginning we were more prone to admit those patients in the hospital who were very young because we were thinking that as it happened with other viral infections, they, they would have a, a poorer prognosis. And now we have seen that that's not true. So probably that there's a bias right there, but that's that's our data. And that's a pyramid uh, showing that most of the patients presenting with mild symptoms. Obviously, you are missing here the asymptomatic bar, but that's why at the very beginning we were only testing those uh, significantly symptomatic patients and those requiring uh, hospital admission. Uh, so around one out of five uh, was admitted to the hospital and only one death on all this period in uh, pediatric patients in Catalonia. I mean, it was a 17-year-old a bone marrow transplanted guy who, who unluckily died. And six of them presented with some kind of sequelae. I have to say that the feeling is that uh, immune deficiency is not a group of risk, and I will uh, want to know your opinion about that. But the feeling is that only severe congenital heart disease and lung disease uh, promoted or made it put them at a higher risk to be admitted in the hospital or be admitted in the intensive care unit, probably mainly this heart disease. So uh, we have studied in detail these 90 families because we, we lost some of the other regarding this 163 and we had almost uh, 300 contacts. And uh, that was, uh, there were young contacts because those were uh, the parents, there were few grandparents because they were, I mean, at some point protected and, and separated from, uh, from the kids. But you will see that there's a million of four uh, household contacts that are the epidemiological data. And what it was obvious is that those patients living in the same house actually got infected uh, in a high percentage of, of cases. I mean, you will see that if we, we have 
31% of patients that uh, of contact, sorry, that still remain unclassified because we are waiting for the serology result. But if we only look for this around 200 of uh, contacts that have already been studied, you will see that eight or almost nine out of five um, were, were infected. I mean, those patients living in a close contact in a house uh, infect each other. So um, that could actually uh, confirm the idea that most of the infections that are currently going on in our country are still related to, to the family. And that's the pyramid for the contacts. And what it's true is that, uh, again, you are missing this asymptomatic bar, but hospital admission was very low and intensive care unit too. And probably the reason for that it, is that the median age, low median age that I already uh, showed you before. And what is more important to me, and obviously it has some limitations that I will comment on, is that only three of these 89 families that we studied in only three cases, the index case, the one promoting that there was a, a I mean, the infection in the family was a children, was a child. I mean, the thing is two 17-year-old teenagers and one five-year-old girl. On the other hand, you will see that around 60% of cases, there was an evident adult index case. So our patients were secondary cases. And uh, obviously, you have the limitation that this was done during the lockdown. And you can say, OK, these adult guys were uh, doing their not normal, but they were getting out of how in the front house. And that was not the case for children. But uh, I have not shown this data, but we have two peaks of infection. The first one in the first week after the lockdown. So the feeling is that those patients were infected below before the lockdown occurred. And the other peak is at the very end, once the uh, lockdown was, uh, I mean, I would say relaxed. And those guys, both adults and children, were allowed to, at some extent, get out of the house and, and move around. So uh, obviously, that what, that's not normal life. But the feeling is that if you are living together with an infected one in your house, you will probably get infected. But that's the risk is higher and higher if the infected one is an adult or an adolescent than if, the, if that's the case for a very young uh, kid. And obviously, I think that despite this limitation, that's very useful for the uh, reopening of these schools. And that's what's going on after the, after the lockdown. I said 163 cases during the lockdown. It was two months and a half, 250 in June, and more than 2,500 in July and August. So that means that we are having more and more cases. And that's due to several things. The first is that we increase the ability of performing a PCR test, and that's the number uh, in um, pediatric patients, more than 30,000 um, PCR uh, per month. And uh, there's an increase also in the person of uh, positive PCR, as I said before, again, mainly in those guys above uh, 12 years of age. And what is important, and it's similar to what I showed you for the general population, it does, there's a decrease, a significant decrease in hospital admission. I've shown you that there was around 20% of hospital admissions at the very beginning in March, and now it's less than 0.3%. So we are seeing more cases. We are seeing more cases in pre-adolescence, and we are now uh, seeing more mild cases not requiring hospital um, admission. And that's another study performed by our colleagues in San Juan de you will see that uh, instead of looking for household contacts, they look for summer camps, and they studied more than around two uh, weekly, 2,000 uh, children attending these summer camps in the area of Barcelona. And here you can see that from all these 22 summer camps, around 2,000 children, there were only nine pediatric cases detected by uh, clinical uh, symptoms and 21 detected from passive surveillance from our health uh, institutions. So it means 30, a very low number of patients were infected. So it seems that this is uh, known overnight. I mean, they only stayed for a while during the day and there were only 30 cases infected and they had around 250 contacts, but they only infected 12. And if you can see here, 
from these 30 cases, 22 did not infect any of their contacts. I mean, and that was an active surveillance. They were studying um, PCR by saliva uh, every week. So that those are very important uh, data. And uh, the risk for transmission was lower, 0.3, to what, to what it is for the global population in the area of Barcelona that was around two at that time. And again, this campus with more than five times has washing had less infection than others. So that's a very important point again for the schools. So globally, it thinks that um, clinical curse in children is, is mild and we wanted to check if that also occur in our country and it does. Obviously it can be severe in a relatively small percent of patients and probably that's more important uh, in those countries with a higher percent of um, multi-inflammatory syndrome, systemic syndrome first, and in those countries where you don't have a pediatrician in the, in the primary care, and that's not the case for, for Catalonia and Spain. Uh, those guys with a congenital heart and lung disease, severe forms, non-asthma, no other mild or relatively mild diseases are at a higher risk for severe forms of COVID-19. You can use this uh, score, but obviously I think that uh, if you're a clinician, that's not that difficult. Uh, we are now seeing more and more uh, mild forms in teenagers, so that's why we are having this sec second viral wave, and that could put the return into schools in a problem. Uh, you can you have this significant household transmission, but mainly based on the adult adult or adult child transmission, and uh, the children do not seem to play a significant role on viral transmission. So uh, it seems the school reopening. Uh, we are able to control this community transmission that we are now facing in adult, adult, young adults and adolescents uh, probably is, is safe. And after that, uh, I need to be a pediatric immunologist, so that's why I will show you just the basic data that um, Nizar has shown with me and Isabel might too. Data from 100 patient, PID patients, uh, from March to the beginning to at the end of, of June. It is so important, at least in my opinion, that uh, distribution between diagnostic of uh, immune deficiency categories uh, reflects what it is in the large patient registry. I mean, we did not have a uh, higher incidence in those patients with um, combined or T-cell deficiency, probably showing that and this is, I mean, it, the same thing that is happening for the problem global population is, is happening for PID patients. Obviously, there are groups and, and the COVID human genomic effort is an excellent exercise for that, that will demonstrate some other uh, immune uh, errors of immunity uh, predisposing to severe COVID. Uh, they shown that these risk factors were similar to the general population, but those patients presented at a lower age. And uh, I think that's it together with this graph showing that there was a very small number of pediatric patients with uh, PID. That's uh, 36 patients with uh, primary immune deficiency, and only two of them died from, and during these three to four uh, months. I would say that despite we all protect our patients with primary immune deficiency, if this patient would have, uh, I mean, done the things that like, like flu or RSV or other viruses, I'm sure that this uh, number of death PID patients in any age would be higher. So the feeling is that, and I don't know why, there are several studies that you are aware of, I don't know why these um, patients are at some point protected. Let's see what happens when they are back to, to school. And I think that's it, uh, but there's a lot of people who has helped me with that. You have our colleagues in the pediatric COVID team in my hospital. They, they did a wonderful job during the epidemic. These are the coordinators of the COPEDICAT study, and I would really want to thank Tony Soriano, who has worked in several of these projects, and he has done a great job even being on holiday. So thank you very much, Tony. Data from the ECIT survey has been brought by um, Nizar and, and Isabel. You all know them. And uh, my colleagues in San Juan Nadeo, this is the, the head of the pediatric department, San Juan Nadeo, Juanjo Garcia, has allowed me to share their, their work with you. Obviously, all the families and the patients uh, need to be thanked too. And I think that's it. Uh, I hope I got the right time. Uh, if not, sorry for that. Uh, and I'll be happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you for that wonderful talk. I think you covered some areas that are things that are just constantly on our minds as pediatricians, thinking about the risk for poor outcomes in children with COVID-19, as well as the risk for transmission to children and from children. And, and certainly in the United States, um, back to school has been a very hot topic. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, our first question is from Kate Sullivan. She said, amazing data. The heat map showing the change in age distribution with the second wave is fascinating. Any chance there is an ascertainment effect? Sorry, I was muted. Hear him. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, obviously, obviously there is. I mean, uh, there's there's a lot that we need to check about this data. Those uh, data were sent to me, uh, I think, yesterday from our colleagues in public health. And but that that's true. That's true. You're right. Another question that we have uh, started with nice presentation and amazing data. Congrats. What was the percentage of patients with comorbidities, uh, healthy children in the retrospective cohort? Hi, Philo. Thank you very much for your words. I know you can see that we are friends. That's why she's so happy with the presentation. So the thing is, um, it, I have shown you the, all the data because I had no time for that, but that was around 22% of these patients presenting with some kind of comorbidities. But again, the, I think there's a bias with that. I mean, because we, and I think that we all did the same at the very beginning, we were more prone to admit those patients with uh, lower age and those patients presenting with any kind of comorbidities uh, to the hospital because we didn't know how they would behave when this infection. So it's around a 22%. And as I said before, there were several comorbidities. I mean, cancer, there was asthma, there was heart disease, lung disease, and so on. But if you look to those requiring, I mean, uh, high flow, candle nasal air, or, or admission to intensive care unit, or those who died, this is mainly based on those uh, who were presenting with a severe and non-resolved, surgical resolved uh, uh, heart disease and those with lung disease, and I would say that it was uh, stronger for uh, non-result, non-surgically results uh, heart disease. And then we'll take one more question, and then we'll um, transition over to our second speaker. Um, this question was from Nikolai Van Ors. He asked, "Is there any evidence the virus from the child is more attenuated due to their immune response relative to the adults?" Oh, hi, Nicole. I mean, that's 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 a very good question, and I would say that there's no answer yet for that. So the thing is, first of all, we are having different data about the amount of uh, viral load in children and adults. There were some initial studies showing that viral load was lower in, in children and adults, and recent studies are showing uh, things from the other side. So. I would say that the first point is that uh, having a positive viral load or even a high viral load doesn't mean that you are, uh, I mean, you are more prone to transmit the virus. And nobody knows the, the role of immune system and the role of local receptors in terms of infectivity and in terms of transmission. So I would say that probably there's something about that probably that's something about the fact that behavior and ability to transmit the virus is different in children than what it is in adults and uh, that there's no definitive data uh, regarding that. Right. Well, thank you again. Um, anyone who has additional questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but we are going to move along to our second uh, presenter now. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, this is Nikita Raje. I'm one of the immunologists at Children's Mercy Kansas City and early career immunologist committee member for CIS. I'll be moderating the second talk for this webinar. Our second speaker today is Dr. Kathleen Sullivan from CHOP. She's the Wallace Chair and Professor of Pediatrics, and she'll be talking to us about COVID-19 and inborn errors of immunity. So Dr. Sullivan, take it away. Nikita, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to work with you. So I'm uh, with that excellent introduction from Pear, I think um, we will go ahead and move through a few topics. I don't have any 
conflicts of interest. So I'm going to just get started with the content slides. I'm just going to remind you a little bit about pathogenesis. This is not a pathogenesis talk, but I think it helps to sort of frame our thinking about effects related to inborn errors of immunity. I'm going to speak fairly broadly about immune compromise and lessons from other types of immune compromise. Then I'm going to go through the data that Pear introduced in a little bit more detail, and I'll end by talking about MIS-C. My references are at the end, and I do think that this will be posted, and hopefully you'll be able to actually click on the DOIs since many of the papers I'm going to review or the studies that I'm going to review are actually in BioArchive. Oops, sorry, I keep trying to use my keyboard. So really brief pathogenesis. I don't want to linger on this. I just want to sort of frame the subsequent discussion. So the way I have uh, laid this out could be relevant for any viral infection. So there's the initial moment of infection, the inoculation. We know there's local production of type 1 interferons. For SARS-CoV-2, we know it's about a five to seven day latency before you see um, symptoms, usually fever and respiratory symptoms. And then over the course of the next one to two weeks, patients will declare themselves as needing hospitalization or being capable of recovering with minimal support at home. And right around that branch point, there is, of course, antigen-specific T-cell expansion. And then we think these cytokines and chemokines are really what's driving the distinction between the folks who recover uneventfully and the people who need hospitalization, or at least those who need advanced care. And why do we think that? Well, inflammatory cytokines are responsible for many of the end organ effects. And I'm not going to speak about thrombosis, although I think it is a major contributor to end organ effects, but I see that as downstream of cytokines. And so not surprisingly, as Pear introduced, a lot of our treatment for the most severe cases is directed at quelling the hyperinflammatory response. And so beautiful controlled study just released about dexamethasone that was shown to be effective. Tocilizumab has a large study that's been released. Anakinra, a much smaller series, and then very small case series on imipalumab, JAK inhibitors, and TNF inhibitors. But you get the, the concept that the idea is that these very sickest patients that have hyperinflammation, the best way to help them is to really quell that inflammation. Now, this is sort of a cautionary tale. I'm going to talk about blood because we are immunologists and blood is what we like to deal with. But I do think there's an important message here. This is a paper that's still in bioarchive, bio as far as I know, by Damon et al. And I'll just orient you. You just need to sort of take away an impression of this graph without getting too mired in the details. So they did... Um, an analysis of lung tissue from autopsy samples, which is the white bars, bronchoalveolar lavage specimens, which is the gray bars, and the black bars are blood samples. And this top half is chemokines and the bottom half is classic cytokines. And what I hope you can take away just by looking at it is that the blood is a very pale echo of what's going on in the end organs. Now that's probably also true for influenza or probably any other viral infection, but I think it's worth remembering that what we are mostly measuring is probably not exactly the same thing that's going on in the end organs that we care about. Now, this is a concept I'd like to warm you up to, and that is that the myeloid compartment is probably more central to the pathology than the T cells and B cells. So this is from a paper also still in bioarchive by Chevrier, and they did single cell RNA-seq. They used the World Health Organization distinction between mild, moderate, and severe cases. I know this is a little hard to see, uh, it was just extracted from the bioarchive paper, so it's a little bit blurry. So let me just orient you to what's being displayed here. So these are four novel monocytes defined by single cell RNA-seq. If you look at the tiny little green blob in the left of each panel, that's healthy donors. These four cells that are distinguished by their transcriptomes are not seen in healthy donors and notice that they are seen both in the mild cases and the severe cases on day one when they walk in the door. So this is a unique cell type that is produced or at least appears in the blood 
during COVID-19 that is not seen in healthy donors. So monocytes, you get the sense that there's quite a monocyte effect here in the disease. Now this is from the same paper and many of the published papers that have looked at T cells, that have looked at serum cytokines, have looked at the evolution over time distinguishing between severe and mild cases. If you look at the right-hand panels, which are CCL2 and CXCL4, you will see that phenomenon globally represented. So the more severe cases over time evolve to have higher levels of the cytokines and chemokines. But again, what I would point you to is the left-hand side of this figure, which is gamma interferon and MCP2. Notice that you can distinguish when the patients walk in the door on the basis of those cytokines. And remember, this is single cell RNA seq, so very sensitive at looking at pathologic changes. So, if I was going to summarize what I hope you take away from the pathogenesis, we have this infection, we have symptoms, and then in the second week of disease, folks sort of partition themselves into mild versus those that need hospitalization. And it does appear, now I'm a myeloid person, so that's how I'm gonna see things, but it does appear that a lot of the dictates of the hyperinflammatory state and the more severe cases are driven by myeloid activation. So with that lens, let's look at a couple of non-inborn errors of immunity as exemplars to help instruct us. And I'm gonna start with HIV. I'm highlighting two abstracts that have not been published yet, a large paper from Spain by Vizcara and a study from South Africa. So Vizcara was the first large HIV study to be published and what they note and the thing that I would like you to take home about these data is that severity did not track with T cell count. Now, what a surprise is that? You couldn't really say that about very many other viral infections. So that was the first paper to come out that was large enough to really support the idea that T cell counts within reason don't seem to be a major mediator of severe disease. Um, two weeks ago, there was a large AIDS conference and two, um, Two abstracts were presented, which also confirmed that T cell counts don't seem to stratify with severe disease. And also the people with HIV didn't in general have a higher or longer rate of hospitalization. I would say this is somewhat counterbalanced by a cautionary report from South Africa. There's some quite amazing data coming out from South Africa on COVID-19, but there was a group that looked at their HIV population and they did see an increased um, relative risk for mortality of about two. For those of you who follow this literature, just to give you a sense of where an odds ratio of two falls out, Age, so age over 60 has an odds ratio of about um, seven or eight, and obesity likewise has an odds ratio of about six to seven. So this is small in comparison to other comorbid features. So let's look at biologics. So T cells don't seem to be a huge dictator of severity. So let's just look at biologics. Again, there are some data. So there's a beautiful um, multinational registry for patients with rheumatologic disease that was just published by Gian Francisco. It has the advantage of a huge sample size. The risk factors were, for hospitalization were the same as the general population. So nothing unique about that. Among drug treatments for their patient cohort, chronic steroids increased hospitalization, TNF inhibitors and non-steroidals decreased hospitalization. So again, this idea that quelling, excuse me, quelling the hyperinflammation is beneficial. And then just released this week is a study from Spain by Pablos, and they did see that connective tissue disease, so things like lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, dermatomyositis, those did confer an increased odds ratio compared to rheumatoid arthritis. But again, look at that relative risk. It's pretty small compared to the other big players. I like this study. It's not particularly new. It's been out for several months, but I like it because they break down their biologics into different cytokines, into different pathways. And I would just have you um, look at the last column or the second to last column for the odds ratio. Notice that in general, the odds ratios are below one. So certainly having your cytokines inhibited, not a significant risk factor for severe disease and possibly protective 
Remember in the Gianfrancesco trial or study, they showed that TNF inhibitors were protective for admission. So in general, it does not seem that many of the things that we associate with increased risk of um, adverse outcomes related to viral infections hold true in COVID-19, and what a surprise. And so as Pear has introduced, the inborn errors of immunity, um, you would think would be associated with severe disease. I will say the CDC lists it um, on their comorbid features associated with disease severity, but they do put an asterisk saying that there is limited evidence. So what is the evidence they cite? So the initial large, large cohort studies to come out of China, so two large ones of roughly a thousand patients, list immune deficiency as a comorbid feature in approximately two to 5% of the patients. It is used as a categorical description, so it's not necessarily inborn errors of immunity. And, um, and so that's really all the data that was out there. So let's look at um, what we have in a bit more detail. So the first paper to come out that I'm aware of is by Isabella Quinty. And although this is a small study, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it because I think it speaks to the power of clinical observation. So she published a report of seven patients with antibody deficiencies, two with agamma globulinemia, five with common variable. There was one death. As Pear says, this is roughly in line with the mortality in the general population. But in the discussion, Isabella's group had this observation that they said the patients with A gamma globulinemia did better than those with common variable. And is there a message there? And they appropriately say this is a small study, but Isabella's group are the consummate clinicians and they certainly were paying attention to features like that. When you pair this with a study by Soracina that reported two patients with XLA who did develop pneumonia, but otherwise recovered uneventfully, um, it, you do get the sense that a gamma globulinemia is not a risk factor for severe disease. And so I'm pairing these clinical studies with an interesting drug trial where they used a calibrutinib. This is a BTK inhibitor that was developed to treat CLL but they decided to use it to treat severe COVID-19, which I actually think was really brave, but I will share with you the data. So they, it's an uncontrolled trial. There's no comparator group, but clearly they feel that the patients did much better. Several times in the manuscript, they say, and the next day, the patients were much better. So clearly they believe it had a very beneficial effect. And here's why I mentioned this drug trial. Whether, whether the improved outcome was true or not, they felt that the benefit that they saw was associated with decreased monocyte production of IL-6. Remember, BTK is not just important for B-cell development, it also impacts toll-like receptor signaling in monocytes. And so they felt that some of the benefit was probably traceable to the effect on monocyte IL-6 production. Well, let's come to the study that Pear introduced. So this was a study that Isabel Mates and I put together along with Stu Tangy. It is actually from IUIS. We wanted it to be branded internationally so that people would feel free to contribute from all continents. The data that I'm gonna share with you is the data that's in the paper. So 71 patients, 60% hospitalization, but there was quite an ascertainment bias, 11% mortality. As Pear has introduced, this is quite in line with the general population. So I'm gonna show you this graph several times because I wanna look at the data with some granularity. So let me just explain what is in this graph. So the blue bars represent the mortality rate in the CDC data. So this is American mortality data but you can see the age effect, I think quite dramatically here. And then what I've superimposed is the mortality rate from this IUIS data set. And you can see, again, I've binned by age. Now there's a little fudging here because the age bins didn't exactly line up. So, um, but conceptually you can take this as the point I'm trying to make. There does still seem to be an age effect. So let's look at a little bit more detail, what happened to the youngest child. So this was a CGD patient that was undiagnosed, developed Burkholderia sepatia sepsis, HLH, and died. 
Hold on to that HLH thought. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. The next patient up in age is a patient with a combined immune deficiency who developed sepsis and HLH. And then the next three are very similar. I'm just gonna orient you to what I have over on the left-hand side. I'm just gonna tell you the diagnosis. They're all antibody deficiency from here on out. The comorbid features are in the second little compartment that I've listed, and the cause of death is in the bottom compartment that I've listed. So here we have two patients with antibody deficiencies. They did have significant comorbidities of cardiomyopathy and lymphoma, and the causes of death were sepsis, renal failure, and heart failure. Two more patients with antibody deficiency, significant comorbid features also died of sepsis and renal failure. And finally, this last group, also antibody deficiency, significant comorbid features, not unusually for that age group, and then death from sepsis and renal failure. So I'd like to sort of circle back to the overall complication rate, which again, um, Pear introduced, but I want to highlight this 7% rate of HLH. It's not as clear cut as you might think that it's increased. I personally think that it's increased and certainly in the young patients, it was the main cause of death. Um, but let me explain why it's complicated in a minute. I also wanna cite the kidney failure, which is quite common among hospitalized patients with COVID-19. I don't think that that's over and above what is seen in the general hospitalized patient uh, population, but it might be. And then the last thing I want to highlight is one for which I don't have a comparator. So increasingly, there are reports of autoimmune disease that either occurs coincident with acute COVID-19 or post-infectious COVID-19. And some of the things that have been described are highly diverse. So vasculitis was one of the first things that I saw in terms of autoimmune disease. Now there are multiple reports of Guillain-Barre, multiple reports of autoimmune cytopenias. What I don't have for you is I don't have a compilation where I have a sense of what the frequency is in the general population. So I think 4% is probably higher than the general population, but hard to be sure. So let's come back to this HLH question. So not as straightforward as you might imagine. So hyperinflammation, very common. We've been talking about that and the use of cytokine inhibitors to quell the hyperinflammation. There is evolving something called an H score. So I'm not gonna go through the entire way that it's calculated, but it's based on CRP, ferritin, and several other clinical measures. About 7% of patients overall have an H score over 169, which is used as the cutoff for hyperinflammation. Because of the cytopenia, so most people with acute COVID-19 have lymphopenia, so you've already got cytopenias, now you've got high ferritin, you've got a high CRP, you're kind of most of the way to a diagnosis of HLH, but it doesn't look like regular HLH. It doesn't look like HLH that we see. There's not really any hepatosplenomegaly. There's little hypofibrinogenemia. So to us as HLH people, it, it just seems like hyperinflammation and not HLH. But you can appreciate that the waters are a little bit muddy because of this. So I'll just sum up this survey before I launch into Miss C. So the different diagnostic categories are different colors, and then the wedges that are cross-hatched are the mortality. I'm just showing this to make the point that mortality was seen across multiple diagnoses. So with that, I'm going to just say a few words about Miss C because it's really kind of taking over our conversation, at least in pediatrics. So this is also called PMISTS in Europe, but hard to say, so I'm gonna stick with Ms. C. There is a CDC definition, but that definition has been modified by various groups because folks feel that it's very restrictive. What I will say is that it does seem to be a post-infectious phenomenon with COVID-19. So Pear has already introduced the timing. The timing of Ms. C in the dark red is offset from the um, acute COVID-19, which is the light orange. And we have a patient at CHOP where we know she converted to um, PCR positive on one day and three weeks later, she presented with Miss C. So very much in line with the epidemiologic data. The largest series published to date is this MMWR cohort. Median age was eight years. Pear introduced the idea that children of color 
are really uh, disproportionately affected. Definitely true in the U.S. People of Latinx ancestry and Black ancestry definitely enriched, unfortunately. I'm gonna come and talk about some of these features in a moment, so I won't go through this list, but it's really the myocarditis that gets kids into trouble. So let me just compare Kawasaki. When Miss C first made its appearance, people were saying, oh, it's Kawasaki disease. I would say yes and no. So the features that are in common, I've boxed in blue. The features that, in, that are in green are slightly different quantitatively and qualitatively, but the ones in red are sort of the big picture differences. So diarrhea and abdominal pain, very common, including um, being worked up for appendicitis. But the thing that is really impressive is the cardiac shock. True for laboratory features, so some commonalities. The differences, I would say, is Kawasaki has high platelets, high lymphocytes. covid C has low platelets, low lymphocytes. I'm going to say a bit more about endothelial activation in a minute. So we have a study coming out from CHOP, and there's a partner paper that's in the same journal. Um, and what I'm going to highlight is this incredibly low-tech diagnostic approach, and that's to look for Burr cells. And I will show you a picture in a minute. We did find some cytokine differences, but not enough to be on their own diagnostic. So we see high gamma interferon, IL-10, and TNF. We see tons of complement activation. This is the Burr cells. So all credit to Michelle Lambert and Michelle Paisler who noticed this early on. Look at these Burr cells. You don't need to be a hematologist. This is really um, very impressive. We also see some neutrophil toxic granulations, but that can be seen in sepsis, so less useful. This is the companion paper that I mentioned, just showing some cytokine differences between macrophage activation syndrome and MIS-C. But one of the things I wanna highlight is that two of their patients had prior Kawasaki disease, suggesting that people are wired for hyperinflammation and this is just a trigger. Well, I wanna share some data from Philomene Herink um, from Belgium, and just quickly, I'll go through these. She has a meta-analysis that is not yet published, but she was nice enough to share these data. Notice the mortality is about 1% to 2% for Miss C, um, and the severe course is really dictated by the cardiac phenomenon. And this might be a little bit small, but I hope you can lean in and see some of the differences between the severe course of MIS-C and mild do relate to the GI manifestations and cardiovascular. Notice as you go up in severity, you look a lot less like Kawasaki disease. And then the last slide is, again, just making the point that the cardiac disease is really profound in MIS-C. And it's much less about coronary arteries and much more about contractility and myocarditis. So I will end as Pear did by saying, we have a long way to go. There's a lot of COVID-19 out there still. And um, I think our journey is far from complete. And while this has been a global tragedy in terms of the people that have died, whose lives have been impacted, um, it has been a time of unbelievable transparency, particularly in our community and collaboration. And so if there is a little bit of a bright light, I'd like to hang on to that. And I'm gonna end by acknowledging IUIS who stood up this survey that both Pear and I have talked about within about a two week period. So very quickly, Isabel Mates and I wrote a number of the questions for the survey. Stu Tangy supported it as chair of the IUIS Inborn Errors Community. And as Pear talked about, this has now been turned over to IPOPI. Again, we wanted an international approach to this and Nizar Malui is now running the survey. And of course, thanks to the patients and all of the physicians. So I'm going to end there and hopefully there's a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman, that was a great talk. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and relay the questions that are here. Uh, there's a comment, thank you so much for wonderful talks today. And then uh, another, uh, Dr. Pear Soler had, um, says, wonderful talk, Kate, how would you answer to the question of the day for all pediatricians nowadays? My son or daughter has a PID. Should I send him to school normally? Any subgroup specific recommendations? 
I can only tell you that we convened a task force locally on that question. We decided that antibody deficient patients had no restrictions. So if their school was open, to be honest, most of our schools are not open, but if their schools were open, we thought they should go. Um, very reserved about CGD and other conditions with a lot of inflammation. So some of the immune dysregulation conditions as well. So we let the antibody deficient patients go, but many of the others were having a much more restrictive approach. And I don't know if that's right. I'll just say parenthetically, it's what made sense to us. And I think in another few months, we'll have better data. Okay, thank you for that. Um... Are there any other recommendations to base anticoagulation on inflammatory risk? So uh, I work in a pediatric hospital, but we certainly are sharing data with our companion adult hospital. So all of the patients in the ICU with severe disease are getting anticoagulated. The thrombotic effects are really pronounced and clearly impact the end organs dramatically. All right. A uh, couple of other comments. Really great presentations of very interesting data. Thank you so much. Thanks for fascinating insight. Are you getting a sense regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the heart after the acute illness? Any coronary artery dil dilation as might be seen with Kawasaki? Yeah, I sort of skipped over that. So in Kawasaki, we see true aneurysms. Although aneurysms were reported in the MMWR study and in Philomene Hayrink's meta-analysis, we have not seen that. We've seen dilation and we've seen brightness on echo, but we haven't seen true aneurysms and we haven't seen late aneurysms so far. So I think more to come on that. Okay. There are a couple of other questions in Q&A. Is there any evidence the virus from the child is more attenuated due to their immune response relative to adult? I think that was really for pair. So there are two clades of virus, as most of you know, and the virus does additionally mutate while it's replicating inside the body. To date, there's not any sense that mutations are any different in kids than in adults. Okay, what, um, one more, oh, or a few more. Um, wonderful, we'll give as well good references. Uh, what is the driving, what is driving the information and activation of the unusual monocytes? Ah, Great question. Um, unclear if it's driven directly by the virus. You could imagine a model where it's really the virus doing that, um, or whether it's it's downstream of some other immunologic effect. I think what's exciting about that monocyte data, the Chevrier paper with the single cell RNA seq, is because we see those differences on day one when the patient walks in the door. Now that's after you know a week of clinical infection, but I think it suggests that it's a very early phenomenon, if not directly driven by the virus itself. Mm. All right. Well, in the interest of time, I know we are over. We have three more questions, if I can quickly go through that. Um, are people thinking that MSC equals TMA? Um, no, um, people are not thinking that. So while we see... Um, uh, although we could get there, but I will say so far we see complement activation and endothelial activation, but not really any evidence of, um, of, of thrombi that are occlusive and causing disease. Um, so for it, just as an example, we don't see the characteristic renal findings that you would expect with TMA. Sounds good. Did the two patients with prior Kawasaki present with a more Kawasaki-like or a more severe MIS-C presentation? And what advice are you giving to patients with prior Kawasaki and new diagnosis of COVID? I actually don't know the answer to that question, but what a great question. So that's from the um, companion paper and it might actually be in the text and I just missed it. So I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a great, uh, it's a great idea. And I will just say 
in a semi-related vein, some of you may have seen a paper to come out recently from Janet Chow, and they identified a SOX1 haplosufficiency that was associated with Evans syndrome, but one of those patients did get um, Miss C. So I think there probably is a genetic contributor. Good. And then the last one, is endothelial activation more pronounced than other SARS viruses? Oh, Amit, I saw that question come up in the chat box. I don't know. I don't know the data on MERS and SARS, so I can't answer it. And I think that was the last question. Well, thank you so much to both the presenters. We really appreciate all the information. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and put in a word for these webinars. Uh, this was a special edition, but say CIS has other case presentations every month. And if you guys uh, have an interest in presenting, please look at the CIS website. Uh, if you would like to uh, present, please go ahead and submit the case. Um, any other words from the presenters before we end? No, thanks for having me. Not from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you.